Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 3rd of September of 2021. Just kidding, 2020. I'm dying to get out of 2020, I guess. The article that I'm going to be discussing today was published in Chest just two days ago, and it's titled, How I Select Which Patients with ARDS Should Be Treated with VV ECMO, which VV ECMO is venovenous extracorporeal membranous oxygenation or membrane oxygenation. I really have to tip my hat to the authors of this study. I definitely recommend you download the study for yourself. It's free. It's in the show notes. It's on my website. Download it for yourself. Don't trust me. And again, tipping my hats to the authors named Caroline Bullen, Ricardo Tejero Paradis, and Eddie Fan. I honestly can't get into every single nitty gritty detail of VV ECMO. So I definitely recommend that you read the source article for this paper, which is down in the show notes, as well as my page that I've created on VA and VV ECMO. But for the sake of background, there are several indications for VV ECMO, which include people who are in ARDS, which is the acute respiratory distress syndrome. I mean, these patients could have bacterial pneumonia. You can see it in viral pneumonia, such as what we're treating right now with COVID, as well as what's coming up with influenza, patients who aspirate. You know, you could also put people on VV ECMO for those people who, in whom you need to rest the lungs, like people who had major trauma, where, you know, the contusions can negatively affect lung function. You could also use VV ECMO in patients who are pre and post lung transplants. This is sometimes the only way you keep the patients alive until they get the transplant. So just something to keep in mind. In addition, patients who are in status asthmaticus, who you can't ventilate, those are also some people who will benefit from VV ECMO. And lastly, people who are bleeding out of their lungs with either massive hemoptysis or pulmonary hemorrhage that you can't oxygenate them and can't ventilate them, well, VV ECMO might be something for them. Although you do have to think about the fact that these patients, the majority of the time, now there's some case discussions and whatnot where they're not anticoagulating the circuit. But, you know, if you have to anticoagulate the circuit and they're having pulmonary hemorrhage or massive hemoptysis, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. But those are the indications, generally speaking. Of course, there are things that I can't mention here for putting somebody on VV ECMO. So getting back to the article that I'm using as a reference for this podcast, I think it's a really good article and it's part of this new series at least that I've known noticed in chest which is called how I do it in critical care so this is the opinion of somebody who's an ECMO practitioner starting off we're going to look at the eligibility criteria which the first thing is do we need this patient to be on VV ECMO for oxygenation and or ventilation criteria and a lot of this is subjective this is my this is my tidbit But we're going to start off with the fact that the patient needs to be on an FiO2 greater than or equal to 80% and a PEEP greater than or equal to 10 centimeters of water. The patient also has to have a tidal volume less than or equal to 6 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. This is all honestly ArtsNet criteria. Getting back to these criteria of FiO2 PEEP as well as tidal volumes, those of us who've been taking care of COVID patients in 2020 on the ventilator I've noticed that almost every single one of these patients has ended up with settings greater than this. But does that mean that all these patients should be on ECMO? Well, that's that's subjective. But the truth is that we don't have enough ECMO circuits for all these people who fit these criteria. So you have to be very, very careful when determining who's eligible and who isn't. And this paper goes over all those other eligibility criteria. Once you check off the boxes of FiO2, PEEP, as well as tidal volume, you need to look at the PF ratio of the patient. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what the PF ratio is, it's honestly the PaO2 divided by the FiO2. This is all documented in the ArtsNet papers that came out in the early 2000s. For those of you who want to nerd out a little bit more and define your ARDS a little bit more clearly, There's something called the Berlin definition of ARDS, also known as the Berlin criteria. In this case, the PF ratio that's less than or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury is considered severe. Moderate is between 100 to 200 and mild is between 200 to 300. So for the sake of simplicity, patients who are going to be considered 
for VV ECMO should have a PF ratio less than 100, which is considered severe ARDS. There are people, of course, who think that COVID is not ARDS, but that's not a topic that I'm going to get into here. In addition, you need to ask yourself before you make the call for an ECMO center or go ahead and put the patient on ECMO, you need to ask yourself if the underlying disease is reversible, because if it's not reversible, then what's the point of putting them on it? And then the other thing is that have you actually done a good job of, man of managing the ventilator? Are you doing your lung protective ventilation, like, you know, keeping the patient's tidal volume to be less than or equal to six cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight? Have you optimized the patient's PEEP? Have you paralyzed the patient? Have you tried a prone position ventilation on these patients? If you have not done these steps, then cannulation isn't recommended. You feel really good about yourself. You've done the lung protective ventilation. You've optimized the PEEP. They're paralyzed. They're prone you still can't get the PF ratio to improve. The next question is, how long has the patient been on mechanical ventilation? Because the truth is that every day that passes where the patient's on mechanical ventilation and not on ECMO is a day that their mortality is going to increase once they get put on ECMO. And when you consider risk benefit of things, which is something that we need to take into consideration for every single patient we take care of, Sometimes the harm might be greater than the benefit. But the next step is knowing that you have to go ahead and anticoagulate these patients on ECMO. And again, these are large bore cannulas that we place in these patients for this. You need to weigh whether the patient could tolerate anticoagulation for a long period of time. In addition, you need to look at the body habitus of your patient because again, going back to the whole thing of cannulation, does the patient have a neck where you could do this? Does the patient have a groin where you could do this where, you know, if they have a huge, huge panis, again, not, not being discriminatory against patients who are super morbidly obese, but we need to take into consideration the logistics here and be completely honest with ourselves from a scientific perspective. But some people just aren't good candidates for cannulation. Then the other thing is that the patients can't be in distributive shock you know, like septic shock with an SVR that's 300, for example. These patients are not going to be good for cannulation. And again, all these contraindications are relative because some people will be a little bit more frisky than others and actually go ahead and cannulate these folks. Again, this is not meant to be an all-inclusive everything. I don't want people yelling at me in the comments section or whatnot about how they do it at their facilities. Again, I'm using source documentation here, which is cited, and you can look at it yourself, which I recommend. But after we look at the contraindications, we need to think about what are the outcomes of the patients should they survive. Again, this is something that is completely subjective, but if a patient has some stage four cancer with metastasis to the brain, they're likely not going to be a good person to put on VV ECMO. They, they just really aren't, even if the, even if the family like yells at you that, they're doing great. We need to consider the resources. Again, don't yell at me. This is all, this is all subjective. And we also have to think about the patient's pre-morbid conditions. You know, does this patient have some debil debilitation or whatnot that will impair their short-term recovery? Or could these comorbidities go ahead and affect their meaningful long-term outcomes? And so the other thing is that, and this is in this particular paper, which says, which asks, excuse me, is the life expectancy due to comorbid, comorbid conditions less than five years? If the answer to the, any of these questions is yes, then the authors do not recommend cannulation. Again, they're not recommended, but it's not an absolute. In my case, I've taken care of patients who have a life, a life expectancy less than five years. They've been placed on ECMO, they've survived, and they've had a pretty good quality of life. Again, that's anecdotal evidence, guys. And of course, you need to discuss with the patient or the patient's family what the actual realistic outcomes are of placing them on VV ECMO or any type of ECMO for that matter. The patient and the family, obviously the patient a lot of these times is going to be under heavy sedation and paralyzed, but the family should be made aware that VV ECMO is not a cure. It's just a band-aid to allow whatever lung process is going on underneath to recover doesn't mean that in two days on being on VV ECMO, everything's going to be great. 
there are patients who are on VV ECMO for weeks and even months. In that process, there are the potential for many, many complications, too many for me to go, to go into in this particular podcast. This is all about informed consent. They need to be informed about what the reality is of being placed on ECMO. All these different things, the eligibility criteria, the contraindications for VV ECMO, the consideration of what the short-term outcomes are, an honest evaluation of the patient's pre-morbid conditions, as well as some good informed consent with the family, and sometimes the patients, I guess. All these boxes need to be checked off because you do not want to waste the time of your friendly neighborhood transferring hospital or ECMO referral center. You don't want to call them and waste your time to evaluate a patient who, who just isn't going to make it. But once you go ahead and you have all these boxes checked off, and again, you need to be very, very diligent in your patient selection to have the best possible outcomes, then you need to go ahead and start looking for a transfer. The call has been made to the transferring facility. You're, spe you're speaking to the clinician who's running the ECMO team, or even if it's in your own hospital, you're talking to your ECMO team. Please be as transparent as possible about all the patient comorbidities and what's going on with the patient and the family. But then the accepting facility goes ahead and sends over their crew to come and take this patient from you. Good job. You got them accepted. But the next step is that the patient needs to be switched over to a transport ventilator. And I'm telling you from experience, the transport ventilators are not necessarily as strong as the ventilator that you have the patient hooked up to in your ICU. So if you're going to make the call to transfer them for ECMO, do it before the patient gets so bad on the vent that they can't tolerate the transport ventilator. It'll also be best, if possible, to go ahead and get an echocardiogram on this patient to assess if the patient has severe left ventricular dysfunction. The reason for this is because it could help out the transferring, the transferring center figure out if the patient is going to be a better candidate for VV ECMO or VA ECMO. Depending on your location geographically and your friendly neighborhood ECMO center, sometimes they have a traveling team which will go and cannulate the patient at your facility. But this is very, very dependent on different facilities. To finish off the podcast, let's do a quick recap on everything that we just discussed, but a little bit faster now, just a little bit of a reminder of what we're going to be doing. First, we're going to look over the eligibility criteria. Is there PEEP high? Is there FIO2 high? Are they in severe ARDS? Have you done everything you possibly could do to make the patient optimize on the vent? That being less than six cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, well, less than or equal to. Is there PEEP optimized? Are they paralyzed? Are they, pro are they prone? Does the patient have any contraindications to being placed on ECMO? Have they been on the vent already for two weeks, for example? Is the patient going to be unable to tolerate anticoagulation? Is the patient honestly somebody who's not a good candidate to obtain vascular access? Is the patient in profound distributive shock? All these things, if the answer is yes, then they're not a good candidate for cannulation. What are the patient's short-term outcomes? What are the patient's pre-morbid conditions? Have you discussed things with the patient and their family in detail? If you haven't done these things, if you haven't looked at them, if you haven't appraised them properly, then you shouldn't go ahead and contact the transfer center yet to get this patient out or the ECMO team if they're in your institution. Then go ahead and make the phone call for the transfer, get an echo, make sure that the patient is nice and tucked in, that you have all the information possible so that they could decide to cannulate either at their institution after a road trip or a helicopter flight, or if they're going to be cool with the team coming in and cannulating at your facility. I hope that you will look up the show notes where you can see the source article for this and not trust me. Thanks for sharing this with your friends. I would appreciate if you gave me a five-star rating or a thumbs up, depending on where you're listening to this, whether it be some sort of podcast station or YouTube. Appreciate all the support. Thanks, guys. Hope you have a great day.